Hey guys, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to a new episode nice of Box Score Geek Show. This one's a special episode. This is episode number one hundred. I don't even have enough fingers to do that. It's ten zero zero one hundred. Um, I am joined by uh, Dre Others. Dre, say hi to everybody. Uh, hey, ideal world. I will be saying very little, if anything, this show. This may be the last you hear from me. Dre's just basically playing a fanboy for our special guest, which we're going to bring on later. Um, and we're also joined by the voice of God, our lovely producer, Brian Foster. Brian, say hi. What's up? And uh, yeah, we got a great show. Um, tell us about our guest, actually. We're going to bring her on in about 10 minutes, I think. Okay, so today we're going to be joined by the Seattle Storms head coach, Jenny Busek. Um, I've been actually struggling to get her on the show for a while now. Feels like sort of a culmination of months of effort to get her on the show. Um, she's going to be joining us by phone call in about 10 minutes, we hope. And I know it's shocking for you, Patrick, that professional athletes and professional athletic coaches tend to be busy. It's kind of an odd thing, right? Yeah. She, I mean, she's busy and she's gated by, you know, an actual, uh, an actual letter of sort of public media relations uh, consultant. So you can't just call her up and say, hey. Jenny, come on the show. <laughs> it's not quite how it works. So there's a lot of back and forth, uh, but hopefully we'll get her on the show. I'm probably going to ask her a little bit about the Seattle Storm, but I actually am more interested in about you know general um, general things about the state of the game today. I don't want to be yet another guy pestering her about who are the Storm going to draft and how are they going to improve next year and all that stuff, which she, I'm sure she has canned answers to. Although, uh, to be fair, right. you are now a Storm season ticket holder. I am a storm season ticket holder. I do actually care who they're going to draft. I do care how they're going to get better. I do care if Lauren Jackson will ever play in a storm uniform again. Um, but, you know, there are other beat reporters who are already on that. And I'm sure she's already given whatever answers she feels comfortable giving to those questions. And she's not going to give us any brand new information about that. But hopefully we're going to be able to, you know, ask her a couple of insightful questions about, about basketball that we can get her to open up a little bit and, and talk to us about the state of the game today. So I will say one major get already, Patrick, is uh, I tweeted out about this show, said she was going to be on it, and she now follows me on Twitter. So uh, hey. I consider today a win regardless. <laughs> hey, hang on. Does she follow me on Twitter? I'm the one that got her on here, damn it. <laughs> well, well you, haven't tweet, you haven't tweeted it out, Patrick. You got That's what you got to do. Let me, um, let me just, let me just, here, take a roasting for two minutes while I eat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, it is worth, worth noting that the WNBA is one of those subjects that we're starting to get excited about. Uh, Dave Barry has, has actually jumped in with gusto on advanced stats for the WNBA. Patrick is in Seattle, and they have a team there, and as mentioned, he's a, a season ticket holder. So this is a major thing for us where, you know, I know we already say we've got 10 projects on the back burner, but WNBA data is is one thing we're hugely interested in. Obviously, Patrick's actually got skin in the game in regards to, you know, if the Seattle Storm are going to get better. So so this was a major show for this. I'm a little jealous. Um, I believe back in the day when I was in Denver, there was a WNBA team there briefly, but there wasn't when I started getting into basketball. And... I, I'm going to get burned here if I'm wrong, but th there is not a WNBA team in Milwaukee, or is there? I don't think there is. I don't think there's one, – one other stress thing I'd like to stress about that, which is kind of annoying, is if you live in a state and people say, oh, you must root for Team X, uh, I live like two and a half hours away from Milwaukee at this point. So even if there was a WNBA team in Milwaukee, it's not as if I can just – you know, I, I'm in a different boat than you, right, Patrick? For you, how how far away are you from the uh, – is it Key Arena still? Is that the – The Key the Arena one? is a short drive for me. In fact, I wouldn't drive. I would take public transport and or an Uber. Um I, not, I not Lyft. You're not going to go – you're going to endorse the, the – Oh, I was Uber. using Uber as a verb like, you know <laughs> – uh, what's like like Kleenex is a noun, I guess. Okay, fair um, enough. Yeah, or Google as a verb or whatever. And I'm sure, I'm sure, is it possible to Google with thing? <laughs> mm. I, I I do love these the are the sort of questions we should ask Jenny when she comes on. <laughs> very which, interesting. Which search engine do you use? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, well, so before she comes on, uh, we had a little bit of an email exchange. Let's just talk about the, the NBA for a second. Uh, we had a little email exchange going yesterday, you and I. Uh, and when I say you and I, I'm talking to Dre, not Brian, for those of you who can't actually tell. Uh, <laughs> we had a little email exchange because Twitter was kind of exploding because one of the beat writers for the uh, Cavs started talking about how defensively 
they're having huge problems because of Kevin Love, and he doesn't fit in the system. They should trade Kevin Love to get pieces that fit better around their offensive system, which essentially, as far as I can tell, boils down to give LeBron the ball and see what happens, which is the offense that Mike Brown won, which worked out so well for them in four different championship final series. So, I mean, and, and your response to that, to me, right, you wrote a little separate email to me to avoiding the hell of Twitter, was basically that the Cavs have like a top five defense. They and- had a top three going into the game against the Warriors. Now, the Warriors, just that shellacking, that was amazing. When when you have a when you have a single game in the NBA that legitimately knocks another team like one point in the ratings on like a true shooting percentage or something, yeah. that's just remarkable. That was they they got knocked down a rank because of how bad the Warriors beat them down. Yeah, and and so so they have a top three defense, top four defense after that game, and Kevin Love plays like what thirty three minutes a game. It's the second most minutes on the team behind LeBron James. Yeah. I mean, how good do the other three defenders have to be if if Kevin Love is that bad as a defender in order to – I mean, is I guess what I'm saying is it's pretty improbable based on what we know about other players like Kyrie Irving and even LeBron James at times who's getting older um, that their defenders are so much better than the average defender that they can make up for a player who's so terrible at defense and still be a top three defensive team. And so, by the way, a nice way to tie this in uh, for the theme of the show, which is Jenny Busek. Um, she did play for the Virginia Cavaliers, I believe. That was her college team. So we're keeping it Cavaliers-based. My, my bigger okay, question— good, 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 good transition there. <laughs> th- there we go. But what I was going to say, my bigger question wasn't even if Kevin Love was good or bad at defense. It was if you call a player a liability, defensive liability, offensive liability, how, what does that actually mean? Because if Kevin Love is this— God awful, horrible defender, which might be true. I, I I've looked into the stats. I don't think it is. But, I mean, so yeah. for me personally, I think he's a very good, actually, on ball defender, uh, and he's a, a, a below average uh, help defender, an off ball defender. And I get that that's an important part of it too. But I again, I think he's a very good on ball defender. Um, and and then also, I mean, a lot of the vines that we were seeing during that Cavs game is. I mean, I'm sorry, but they were running pick and rolls where they were putting they, – they they were using Steph Curry to, to just put him in the grindhouse, which I, I can't, it's hard for me to think of more than like three or maybe four power forwards in the game that wouldn't have the same amount of trouble with that situation. And by the way, one of those power forwards already plays for the Warriors, so they're screwed there. And, and one thing right? I'll so, note about – if we're talking vines about Kevin Love looking bad on defense against um, Steph Curry, some of the most popular vines I remember back in the day, I mean, this is kind of hit and miss given his health, was Anthony Davis. Steph Curry has made Anthony Davis look ridiculous. And this is a person that, you know, can block from anywhere. So I'm not sh- sure how much much credit I want to give to, oh, they look good bad against one of the best teams in NBA history on a game yeah, that was clearly th- going bad to a- begin with. I think it's sort of a pastime to find vines where Kevin Love looks helpless and lost uh, on help defense. And I'll note, you don't really ever see that see vines where Kevin Love gets made a fool of when he's playing on ball defense, um, which should say something. Uh, and it's kind of similar to what happens to James Harden or even to Marcus Cousins. Like, oh, let's find this spot in the game where he's obviously doing something wrong or maybe giving up on the play or whatever. But those don't tell the whole story, right? Like many, many, many NBA players take positions off, and I guarantee you, if you really followed James, LeBron James, every defensive position, you could find two or three vine-worthy moments where he's kind of not paying attention or doing something else or out of the play. Um, and it just seems like all that's really doing is perpetuating the meme that, oh, Kevin Love is bad at defense. Yes, he's bad at certain parts of defense, but he's actually pretty good at other parts of defense and I also find it interesting when we talk about defensive rebounds we ignore the fact that that's part of the defensive possession is to end the position with a rebound and he's pretty good at that and when you tell people that he's pretty good at that they say well he's only good at that because he's not playing defense and he's boxing out which I don't even know what that means because boxing out is part of defense and and also because well 
if you're not a shot blocker, but you are a good defender, then maybe you're actually playing to your strengths by trying to go for defensive rebounds rather than trying to block shots, which would probably only result in you getting fouls, which would give the opponent free throws. Well, I, I Sorry to jump in, guys. It's 2.30. Ready for our guest? Yeah, go oh, ahead. We are ready. So we're going to bring her on. We're just going to keep talking until you've told us that the call is succeeding. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, so thanks for dealing with us on. sorry about that thanks for dealing with the oh technology. no problem so, i, I uh, deal with technology every day it's a challenge yeah <laughs> well that's actually good it's one of the first things we're going to talk to you about actually but um it's so good to have you on the show i've been trying to uh, arrange this for a couple of months now really looking forward to this um we're hoping we can just kind of sort of pick your mind a little bit about the state of the wnba um I know that you probably have your full of answering questions in specific about the storm all the time, and so I'm, I'm going to try not to ask you questions that that are just going to get canned answers out of you, um, and hopefully we can just kind of chat basketball for a bit. Does that sound like fun? Yeah. Great. Yeah, absolutely. You guys, you have full freedom to ask me any tough questions that you got, that are not politically correct or whatever. <laughs> Ooh, we can ask politically incorrect questions. So we'll, we'll think about that for a yeah. second. First, first, I'm going to try, uh, hopefully, kind of a safe topic. Um, as you know, like our site, because uh, we call ourselves the Box Score Geeks, we're pretty stat-oriented and advanced stat-oriented community. Um, yeah. One of the things that's been like a big deal in the last three to four years has been the development of the three-pointer and how, you know, and then as particularly the Warriors and the Spurs are kind of going crazy with three-pointers in the in the NBA this year. But we've noticed that the NBA, when you look at sort of the percentage of shots that they take from three versus the others, it hasn't shifted a whole heck of a lot in the last few years. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, if that's going to change, is that going to develop differently? Do you think maybe the three-pointer is not all it's boiled up to be? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, you know, I think what you guys do is so interesting. And I, you know, I come from a very analytical research-based family. And so I'm really intrigued by the analytics and how they're impacting our game. Um, but it, it's, it's really fluid, you know, in terms of how it's impacting our game and what's coming first, the chicken or the egg, and how, you know, how coaches are reacting and then overreacting and swinging back the other way. So it's really interesting how it's all evolving. When it comes to the three-point line specifically, um, you know, I think first you've always got to start when you're building a philosophy for your team. Um, you've got to start with the strengths of your team. So it makes absolutely no sense to start jacking threes if you don't have great shooters and, and you're not putting them in situations, you know, maybe to hit threes. So transition threes, for example, are an easy way to get threes, but it's one of the hardest three point shots to hit because mm -hmm. they're finding, and it's, I mean, we know this practically, but you're, you guys are starting to support this with the numbers that not every three point shot is the same statistically. Yeah. So, you know, most kids, most people grow up with the ball getting rebounded from underneath the basket. They go out and they shoot with their buddy, and the ball gets passed from underneath the basket because it's them and a partner shooting. So the highest percentage three-point shots for a lot of different reasons, but I think one of the main reasons because that's the way most players are trained, um, that come from underneath the basket, whether it be off an offensive rebound or a post kick out, um, you know, those are the highest percentage threes. And the second highest percentage threes is a similar situation, but drive and kick, but it's still coming a little bit different angle. And that's second highest percentage. And then the third highest percentage is something that's gotten passed from the perimeter. So when you start to look at the strength of your personnel, the type of three point shots you're getting, I mean, you have to weigh all that out um, to see, you know, is it worth it for you to start trying to emphasize shooting more threes, number one, uh, which players you're, you're asking to do that and what type of three point shots they're getting. So mm -hmm. it's a, I think it's these are all multi-layered, uh, very you know situation specific uh, questions and answers. So uh, let me I, I I think I understand and agree with pretty much everything you said there, and it, it really does make a big difference to whether you're you know e even even position makes a difference. Are you shooting from you know the slot or are you shooting from the corner or yeah. the top of the key, right? Yeah. Um, well, let me play devil's well, advocate. for the NBA, it's a little bit different. The NBA, that, that is a little bit unique to the NBA, that the corner threes are such an advantage because it's so significantly shorter distance right. for their three-point line, more so than it is any other three-point line in the world. Well, that's true, but okay, maybe I'm maybe I'm going about this wrong. So, when I was playing, I used to love shooting the the, the corner of the baseline shot, right? And I found the shots mm -hmm. in the slot to be harder because you saw you're lined up to the basket, and you you pretty much like if you're off by a little bit, it's going to bounce off the backboard in a weird way or whatever. So those shots that were either from dead on, uh, where the backboard is perpendicular to you, or from the baseline, seemed easier to me. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's just an illusion. 
confusion. Maybe that's just a player preference thing. Uh, and then there's also yeah, the I fact think that's that more of a player preference thing. You know, okay. when if you're not talking about the NBA three point line where it's a difference, a significant difference in distance, um, yeah. I think it's a player preference thing in a lot of ways, and also what you've repped. You know, which one you've repped the most? Yeah. Well, and I think another argument, Mike, because you mentioned that the, the drive and kick is a is a big one, right? That that's yeah. often where the ball's going to go on a drive and kick just because yeah. of the spacing, because the, the driving guard's not going to throw the ball behind themselves very easily, right? So, it, and, and, and if that happens, I think you are generally left more open in that scenario than, you know, if you're just being passed in the perimeter where the defense has just kind of pretty, got a pretty easy rotation path to, to you. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, very that's, valid. that's spacing thing, but but if I can play devil's advocate here for just a little bit, um, if we just we just talk about a little math, like a lot of times we throw out the 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 statement that a bad three is probably better than a good long two because those good long twos you're going to hit them like forty percent of the time maybe, and a bad three you're going to hit like maybe thirty percent of the time, and if you do the math, it kind of works out to be more valuable to take that bad three. What would you say to that argument? I think, you know, it makes sense on paper, okay? But, again, <laughs> it's, it's the strength of your players, number one. So, for us, Sue Bird, a pull-up jump shot long two is basically a layup for her, you know? Sure. So, we, we don't, we're not across the board, you know, telling all of our players long twos are bad shots because for some of our players, that's a very high percentage shot. So, I, I think it's a little bit oversimplified what you're saying, although it does make sense numerically. The other, diff- the other thing you got to weigh in is the longer shot you take, the misses are longer, and transition defense is probably the most difficult thing to guard in professional basketball. And so, you know, the longer shot you take, longer rebounds, the more you're in transition defense, so you have to be geared up for that as well. Um, you know, and then the final thing I'll add just is, is this is just all information that makes these conversations so interesting, and they, they're a constant debate for us on the coaching end, or they should be, um, is that now, as a reaction to the analytics, more teams are, are subscribing to the philosophy that you just mentioned, mm-hmm. that a three is better than a long two. And so now pretty much every defense in the NBA or, or many defenses in the NBA, WNBA, are now geared up to, to take away the three and give you the long two. So as that's been in play for however many years, now players are actually getting better and better and better because their player development emphasis is the shot that the defense is giving them, which is long twos. If there's a little pocket in there for the pick and roll defenses in particular, um, that that's what the defense is giving players. And so now player development emphasis has become hitting those long twos. And I think at some point, because that's going to end up being a higher percentage shot as player development has swung that way, then, you know, then defenses are going to have to, to counter and the percentages are going to change a little bit, if that makes sense. It, it makes a little bit of sense to me, but I'm going to play devil's advocate again. <laughs> uh, sure. and say, so, so recently on a, I forget what, I think it was on a Turner broadcast. It was maybe about three weeks ago. And Mark Jackson said something that had everybody, it, it made him an enemy, it made him like enemy number one on Twitter for like a day and a half, which was that he said he thought Steph Curry was bad for the game because kids are going to go out and try to emulate Steph Curry all the time. They're going to go out and they're just going to jack threes all day long. Um, to which I would argue that that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, back in the day, people used to say Michael Jordan would be bad for the game because kids are just going to try to be like Michael Jordan because there's inevitably going to be a few talented kids there that are actually going to be really good at that. So, so, so what I'm proposing is that maybe there's going to be a shift and now like the young girls and the young guys that are are learning to play instead of trying to be like Michael Jordan, they're going to try to be like Steph Curry and they're going to develop these amazing deadly three point shots that go not just to the arc, but beyond the arc. And will that shift the game again? Is that going to like, is that going to open up the floor even more and sort of exacerbate this math? Yeah. I, like I said, this goes back to my original statement, which is, you know, you want to play to your player strengths, or if you have a system that you really believe in, you have to find players that fit into that system. So I think things are ever changing because it's a it's a it's an action reaction type of of game you know where um, so players are reacting you know to Steph Curry and how he's playing and how Golden State is playing so they're going to probably start shooting a lot more threes and then defenses are going to react to that and so all the defensive schemes are going to be geared towards taking away three point shots and giving up long twos so then do players start reacting by perfecting the long two. Um, or, you know, like how, how are the actions and the reactions going to affect each other as this thing just continues to evolve? 
Um, and, and the coaches are debating this. I mean, I've talked to NBA coaches even just within the past year where they're talking about, okay, we went away from the long two for all these reasons, but now that's what, that's what defenses are giving us. So now that's what we're actually emphasizing because that is now becoming the highest quality shot we get into possession because the defenses are so uh, clearly trying to take away shots at the rim and threes, you know, yeah. so you just, it's different philosophy. So are we going to try to, you know, try to figure out a way to, no matter what the defensive scheme is, try to get those shots at the rim and threes and try to figure out more and more ways to do that, whether it's our players backing up or different things that we're running to put defenses in a scramble situation and open up three-point shots and shots at the rim, or are we going to go with the flow of, you know, the trends of defenses and now try to burn teams for giving that long to, which they're giving, giving mm. teams now. Yeah. Hey, Patrick, um, do, you, do you mind if I jump in? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Jenny, that that was amazing. And one question I have, because as as you you said a great line earlier, like on paper, because we're we're stats people, and we just yeah we look at the numbers all day, we look at spreadsheets. Something you said that was really fascinating to me is you just said in the last year, as a coach, how are you able to convey all this back and forth to players? Because it it you know as you mentioned, there's so much explosion of data. It sounds like mm-hmm. the the strategies change so quick. Like I I just I, I'm I'm fascinated by being a WNBA coach and being able to go so quickly to just tell your team, hey, by the way, a bunch of numbers people are saying this and these are the trends and here's what I'm hearing. How, how are you able to convey that quickly, especially given, you know, how in flux most team rosters tend to be? Yeah, you know, we, that's what we spend. We spend the off season really evaluating all of these things and coming up with our philosophy so that by the time the team gets back, you know, we know who's on our roster. We've, we've really spent a lot of time sorting through all the analytics and the philosophies and why different coaches in the NBA are doing this, that, and the other, what you guys are saying from an analytic standpoint. And then we come up with what we want our vision to be for our team. And, and then all of our data is going to be the data that supports whatever philosophy we've chosen. So they're not going to be getting conflicting information all throughout the season. We're going to be selling them on whatever we have decided on based on all the research that we've done in advance and where we land on what our philosophies are going to be. So all our data backs that up, and they're just getting that reinforced all year long with our systems and our data, you know, and, and all that type of thing. That's very interesting. Propaganda for players. <laughs> it, I mean, it, every coach, every great coach is having to sell – a philosophy, sell a vision, sell an identity, sell a system, and it's it's sales. And so it is one of the tools that works for some players, not others, is data. You know, I think Pat Riley was one of the first coaches to really use this from what I've learned. And he had a guy named Jordan, I can't even remember his last name, that would be in the video room before they had all these computers and stuff, and he would literally use a VCR, and he would go through like a gazillion games, and he would just chart the things that Pat Riley was asking him to chart. And then Pat Riley felt like if you had the number to back it up, it brought more power to his point. You know, so if it was the difference in shooting percentage on uh, field goal attempts where the ball gets into the paint at some point versus the possession versus if it never gets in the paint during the possession, the difference in field goal percentage, you know, is significant. And so that's why it's such an emphasis that, A, we get it into the paint on offense, and B, we keep it out of the paint on defense. You know, the difference in yeah. shooting percentage on a contested shot versus an uncontested shot. And that guy, I mean, I met him when I was coaching back in Miami. Like, he lived in the video room. And he was doing that stuff by hand, like, way before analytics yeah. was was a thing. Uh, yeah. Because Pat Riley just felt like that number, you know, 60% when it's uncontested, or uncontested versus 40% when it's contested made it more valid to – to at least some players. Yeah. And so we want the data to, to you know, it's a combination of both uh, dictating our systems and our philosophies, but also supporting what we deeply believe in. And it's like anything else. You can usually find data to back up what you believe in if you've been in this game any amount of time, but you don't want conflicting data that's going to make, you know, that's not going to fit together in a congruent way because that mm-hmm. will compromise your system. But if you once you decide on your philosophy, which is based on data for some coaches, for some coaches it's based on experience, um, then the data can really strengthen, you know, your philosophy. So you mentioned that, you know, being a coach is really sort of like being in sales. 
And uh, I'm going to try to tie this into my next question. I hope it's not too big of a stretch. So in the in the WNBA, you have kind of a unique problem that I don't think the NBA shares, that many of your players, especially your better players, have another job playing overseas. And for many of them, that other job probably even pays more money. So right. you know, what, what exactly are you as a coach doing to make sure that you get your best or the player's best, you get the best out of the players and that they're not, you know, conserving energy or protecting themselves for their, for their quote unquote day job, which is, you know, overseas during the WNBA's off season. And maybe, you know, a little bit too, I'd be curious what you feel about the sort of frightening trend of, uh, of a, of a team overseas being willing to pay a player like Deanna Tarasi not to play in the WNBA. Okay, you just asked a whole lot of questions with a whole <laughs> lot of layers. Um, I should have used. So I'm gonna try to unpack. <laughs> I'm gonna try to unpack it, and you can point me whichever way you want. But um, in regards to players playing overseas, it's a part of our it's a part of our co- context, you know. And so, as a coach, I feel like you can either fight it um, or you can work with it. And so, one thing I've tried to do is work with it. Because we're not changing it. Because like you said, they make more money overseas in most situations. And that's a reality that I've just come to accept and embrace as opposed to try to fight because it's not going to change. So, for example, I try to go over and visit players overseas um, as often as I can. So I have a more um, empathetic understanding uh, of their entire life. And, and, uh, you know, just working with them on the fact that, hey, I know it's tough. You're playing overseas. You know, these gyms are freezing you don't know about, you don't even know what people are saying to you. You're living in a foreign country and try to just live that life with them and understand how we fit into that life. But they have a whole nother set of coaches. They have a whole nother set of teammates. They've got a whole nother set of championships. And I don't want to have like a narcissistic egocentric point of view that WNBA is their life and should be their focus and their priority when it, the reality is it may or may not be. And so I want to work with that instead of trying to fight that, uh, fight against that and make them feel like it's a competing thing. Um, and so I want to try to make things easier for them to, to, to be able to do both things well, um, but then also understanding that their main motivation for playing in the WNBA is not probably the money, especially the higher paid players overseas. So we've got to find other things that motivate them uh, that we're speaking to and creating in terms of situations here that makes them excited about playing in the WNBA, putting their whole heart into the WNBA and not just using this as a leveraging ground to get more money overseas. But that's our job just in terms of, okay, what, so if it's not money that's motivating them to play here, what are some other motivating factors that we can play to um, situations that we can create here that makes them really excited about giving this their all as well, or even more so. Um, And so that's just understanding players, what makes them tick, what, what they care about, and then trying to be in alignment with that and work work with that and play to that instead of just instead of just fighting uh, against and you know a losing battle and not against the situation financially. Um, so I mean I, I don't know if that answers the question about the trend that you said. That's, I think well, you know it's yeah, going to happen. Basically where I'm looking for you to expound on it. I, I guess I I asked a very open ended series of questions and I think you did a great job rolling with it. Um, one of the, you mentioned the fact that they make more money overseas than they do here, and I'm wondering, and this is maybe where we get to a question that's going to make you squirm a little bit. Uh, so about a couple months ago, um, one of our friends, Dave Berry, who wrote the book Wages of Wins, and he's kind of sort of the grandfather of our basketball analytics stats movement here, um, he wrote an article in, I think it was in Vice, but I'm not sure, um, basically making the claim that the WNBA players are actually underpaid. And not not by millions or anything, but that they're underpaid. That if you look at the amount of revenue that the WNBA brings in, and you look at what percentage of revenue that gets paid out to the players, they're probably a little underpaid. Um, is there? Do you think there's any sort of uh, room for sort of a groundswell to, to change that momentum, to get more recognition for the fact that it – just like any sports league, it's really the players that drive the revenue, not, you know, the owners and the marketing and things like that. Yeah. You know, I'm not a business person at all, you know, so I don't really have a great understanding of, of business and our business model and and why the WNBA is choosing um, to allocate things the way that they are. But what I do know, and I know this was part of the focal point of this show was, that, that people don't have the same appetite for women's basketball that they do men's basketball. 
They just don't mm. yet. And and I have different theories on why that may or may not be. I still do think there's a lot of things that we're trying to overcome in terms of people's perceptions. Um, and I mean, that's, that's, those are deeper issues, but the bottom line is it's not, it's not something that is selling the way that the NBA is. And so we have owners that are, you know, we have half our team that are owned by just independent business people. They're not owned by NBA teams. And whether it's the NBA owners or the independent owners, I mean, they've got a limited amount of funds that they're willing to spend on women's basketball. And I'm sure for each of them, it's different for different reasons. But the reality is they don't have just endless funds to spend on the WNBA, and they're not willing to absorb debt and losses the way that, that people are in men's sports. They're just not. And so, again, we can fight that and then this league go under and we have we have no league or we can trust the leadership um, and – and be thankful that we have a league and hope that, that we can grow this thing and that then that trend can change in terms of how much players are paid. I, I, it's great that you brought that up that, you know, it, it seems like the appetite for women's basketball isn't, it, it obviously isn't at the same extent that it is for men's pro basketball. But what, what I always kind of, I find really curious is that in, in this country, there seems to be a tremendous appetite, ap- Added, sorry, uh, a tremendous appetite for sports at all levels, not just at the highest level. So, whenever whenever a person brings the argument, you know, that the men's game uh, just has you know higher skill or whatever, I, I'm first of all I'm a little bit baffled by that statement. But even if I were to buy that statement, then I can turn around and say, yeah, but you watch little league baseball on ESPN, yeah. and, you know, and and you watch yeah. in, in the college men's game, which by definition is you know, leagues worse than the men's game has billions of dollars into it. So it's not the skill level. So I'm wondering what it is that is sort of impacting that are, are those numbers. It's a great, that's a great, great, great question. For some reason, the WNBA is like the only league that I know of that is just constantly compared to the NBA. You know, if you think about men's and women's tennis, you know, people aren't sitting around comparing um, how fast, the women's serves are compared to the men because they're never going to compare, right. you know, but they don't, they, but the point is they don't compare them. They accept the women's tennis game as being different and actually appreciate the differences. Yeah. And, you know, we just, for some reason, we are always compared to them. And as long as we're compared to the NBA, we're always going to be not as athletic, not as big, not as strong, not as fast, not able to do the things that men can do. And you can thank the good Lord for the hormones on that one, <laughs> but it's just not going to change. And so we, you know, as long as we're compared to them, then there's going to be a lot of room for criticism. But I just have never understood why people can't understand and appreciate um, our women for what they do uh, with the, with the skills and the talents that they have and the way that they play that's different. Um, but in some ways is actually a harder way to play um, in a way that, that, you know, a lot of basketball traditionalists really appreciate, but the the common person just just thinks very lowly of. Yeah, it's always been a bit baffling to me because I mean, if you're, I think if you're a basketball fan, then you enjoy watching basketball. I mean, I, mean, I heck, when I'm at the gym playing in a rec league and then my game's done, I'll just sit and watch the next rec league play just because I like watching basketball play. And it's not, it's not the level. It doesn't matter if I'm watching the best or the. It's just I like seeing the game and watching the game develop, and I, I I've never really quite understood this sort of crazy argument that you, if you're not watching the best people play, then it's not worth watching. When I, and if you felt that way, then you know why are you watching a Minnesota Timberwolves game when you could only watch the Warriors, or, or you know, or if you move to the WNBA, it's like, well, why would you watch anything other than like the Lynx play against uh, the the Mercury, I want to say. I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember who was who came in second. <laughs> um, sorry, mm-hmm. that was unnecessary. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a, if you, if you didn't know this, and I guess you don't, it's that I came from Minnesota originally, and I moved to Seattle about ten years ago. So I'm still a bit conflicted about who I'm rooting for. Um, but oh, I am wearing. Yeah. But and you can't see it right now. But I am wearing my Storm T-shirt because I don't know. Awesome. Uh, I got this for Christmas because I got my fiance and myself season tickets and then she responded by getting this t-shirt. I feel like, I feel like she got the better part of that deal. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it, those are great questions and I don't know if some of it's on a subconscious level, but you know, guys who really understand the game of basketball and how it's played, they have a great appreciation for, 
um, how our women play. The average guy who doesn't know anything about basketball, who, you know, just never really played at a very high level, was never coached at a high level, they don't know enough to appreciate the WNBA. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but they, they just don't know enough um, to appreciate our game. And it's something that I've talked to organization about, but, you know, maybe we have to have our commentators and things educating the general population a little bit more so that they're even up to the aptitude of being able to appreciate um, some of the really incredible plays and decisions and teamwork and things like that that our, that our players are making. Yeah. Um, so before I let you go, I guess I do want to ask a couple of specific storm questions, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Try to put you in the spot a little bit. Who are you going to draft? Um, well, I can tell you, like, whether you're a betting man or not, go ahead and bet on who we're going to pick, and you'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> Very diplomatic. Does that answer it? Oh, let me, okay, let me try to give you an answer that you can actually answer. So if you were going to pick, like, what are the key attributes I'm going to look for? What would they be? Well, I'll, I'll just say this. When you analyze the college draft this year, there's one, there's one player in Brianna Stewart that stands out. And she's, you know, she's just better than the rest. She's playing at a different level. She has played at a different level. And I think she has the potential to be um, a really, really good player in our league. It's going to be a transition. It always is for all yeah. of them, for all college players. Uh, but she's got a chance to be a really good player in the WNBA. Okay. And then here's another question. Is Lauren Jackson going to suit up again for the Storm? You know, I'll never say never because she is, she's one of the greatest fighters that I've ever been around. And, uh, you know, but her, you know, all of our greatest strengths are our greatest weaknesses. And Lauren was a player that, uh, played through injuries that most people would be in the hospital for. And she was, she would play and she wouldn't just play. She would put up 30 and 20 on you. Mm -hmm. Um, but because of her, her toughness, and her competitiveness and her just sheer willpower and ability to play through as many significant injuries as she had that nobody knew about, um, you know, she's pretty beat up at this stage. So I don't think the odds are great that she's going to play again for the storm. If I'm being completely candid, but we haven't closed the door. If it ain't any other player, we probably would have closed the door, but knowing Lauren, we have mm -hmm. not closed the door entirely yet, but I think the chances are slim. Well, that's a sad answer to hear, but I suspect that's probably realistic. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Eddie, thank you so much for joining us today. We went a little bit over our allotted time here. Uh, I hope that's not interrupting your scheduling today. Um, really appreciate no, having you come on. I got to get on the phone on. with some agents, so I don't mind being a little delayed with talking with agents. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, I well, love talking to hoops, you so me. I could talk hoops all day, every day with you guys. I appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, is that a commitment? And I love to come what you guys are doing someday? with the analytics. Yeah, that, absolutely. I'd love to come back and okay, as long as you give me inside access to some of your <laughs> inside access to some of your data, like storm only gets access. <laughs> I can I can work on that, but I, I suspect it's gonna be <laughs> gonna be hard to pry that uh, away from all the other data. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I'd be happy to share what data we have with you. Um it's probably publicly available data, but we're definitely happy to share like what the conclusions that we came to. There, I'll see if that's any use. I, I'm always interested. You uh, guys, feel free. You have my, my info uh, now. I'd love for you guys to, to keep me posted on what you guys are learning because I filter so, it all. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, one of the key takeaways is probably stuff you already know. Like, oh, wow, Sue Bird is really good. <laughs> um, and you're going you're gonna to look at that and be like, you, you know, I, I feel like this is the kind of thing that makes Charles Barkley shake his head. And it's like, why do we need the analytics guys to tell me this stuff I already know? <laughs> um, but uh, I really appreciate having Sometimes you on. Sometimes you guys... Some guys, you guys really challenge us sometimes, and uh, so I think it's worthwhile what you what you guys are doing. So I appreciate you guys. Well, thank you. I appreciate hearing that, and we really hope to have you back on again sometime. And thanks We'd for love uh, to. thanks for thanks for taking time to talk to us today. Oh, thank you guys. It was fun. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. So. All right, that, Patrick. That was Jenny. Yeah. Great interview. Good job. Um, so we lost Dre somewhere along there, and I when I heard the little hang up sign sound, I was like, "Oh shit, we didn't lose her right in the middle of like a no. great question, right?" So we had to go right at the top of the hour. Yeah, that's okay. And um, but it was I, I basically didn't want to like if she 
if she wanted to keep talking, I wasn't going to stop her. So, you know, like she said, she could talk to us for hours, and I'm like, I, I would welcome that. I'd love to just have uh, her on as a somewhat regular guest and just kind of hear what she has to say about basketball because it's really insightful stuff. Um, I didn't even get around to kind of what I, another thing I wanted to talk to her about was, you know, assistant coaches and or head coaches in the in the NBA. And talk a little bit about she said politically incorrect and I kind of wanted to go into that realm of like okay let's talk about sexism in the NBA <laughs> yeah what did you think uh, uh, she was going for there with politically incorrect questions I suspect she was giving me the green light to ask questions like that but mm. um, I decided you know since it's the first time we've got her on let's keep it to you know less controversial things get to know each other a little better and hopefully have a good solid interview that'll make her want to come back and talk to us again where we can ask unfortunately really for her we're the most politically correct show on the internet so sorry coach no none of those questions today if you're a first time listener you may be missing the note of sarcasm in brian's voice no no we are we're very politically correct aren't we We are not politically no correct. Okay. how many times have i called somebody a nasty word on this well we're mean but you know we're well, it, <laughs> and we're mostly mean to sexists and bigots, I would hope. Yeah, but, that's fair. That's fair. Um, but then, you know, the sexists and the bigots, they might not think of it that way. So, <laughs> Well, what do you think, Patrick? Um, uh, more stuff to talk, talk about? Or? about like, like about Becky Hammond and yeah. how, she, how she'd be as an NBA coach and stuff. But I just didn't want to didn't want to overwhelm her because we only had a half hour and I didn't want her to, you know, come away thinking like, Wow. Why didn't I talk about the storm? <laughs> I'm jealous of uh, you guys, though. She's really sharp. Really she's great. Very answers. sharp mind. I loved her answers on the three pointers because I think, um, you know, it's, it's. I think it's a really. I really like that insightful bit that she actually talked the specifics about. You know, every coach will say, "Well, yeah, you got to play to your personnel," and every coach will say, "Not all threes are, are are equal." But she just went into the detail to explain why some threes aren't as good as other threes and and what the factors are behind that and. That's really that great kind of insight that um, we, you know, we especially love hearing it from a coach um, to give it that sort of extra credibility. You know, when you or I says something like that, the viewers kind of just you can hear, you can feel the viewers' eyes rolling in the back of their head like these nerds. What are they talking about? They don't know what they're talking about. But to hear it from the coach is is good stuff. I still think, you know, I, to, I I'm and, I and I'm not gonna I don't want to talk too much about it while she's not here to like take a counter position but I still think you know the defenses try to protect the three and they try to protect against the rim and so to me there's a big difference between you know that 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 long range two like that 16 or 18 footer that you get out of the action of an offense that is primarily looking for threes and layups and then can fall back on that penetration and get that shot versus an offense like for example Sam Mitchell's in Minnesota where it's almost like the first option that that offense is trying to get is that 16 to to 20 footer which kind of just makes the defense relax and go oh well if you're not going to make me defend the three-point line i won't defend the three-point line you know i did like the answer that she followed up with though saying look we made our plan in the off season and this is what we're going with and this is what we have to yeah, go with all no, year that's and i love the i love what you were saying about about you know giving the players the data that backs up yeah your plan not you know you're not just going to dump an excel sheet in front of the player you're going to pick and choose the data that backs up your plan and you're going to present it to reinforce your vision of where the team goes so that the player you know it's part of a sales pitch i remember when i was a kid when and my coach was trying to teach us how to box out and the coach said you know 70 percent of rebounds are grabbed when they are below the like bottom of the backboard so stop thinking about how high you're going to jump because you can all jump that high anyway. It's all about boxing out. And all of us kind of sit around. 70%? Yeah. I don't, man, I never thought about it. It doesn't matter how high I jump. It just matters if I box out. That's good Looking advice. Now, and I use that quote like at least a dozen times <laughs> myself as a coach. But I'm pretty sure it's made up bullshit. I don't think there's any truth to it or not. Or maybe it's like one guy who did it in one game or something. I don't know if that's a true number. But it helps to like give the players some kind of concrete like number and say hey yeah that makes total sense now i don't have to jump high i just have to box out so i can get that ball yeah my only other question for her on the three pointers would be is she kind of seeing anecdotally now or in high school there are a bunch of teams you know starting to shoot the three more is it is it starting at the lower levels because one of the things is even in the nba it took years and years to adopt the three-pointer because no one knew how to shoot it yet right so 
Really interesting. Yeah, and, then, and then once it was adopted the first time, which was basically Phil D'Antoni, you know, right. um, everybody said, well, you can't win a championship with that. Yeah. And, and, and who knows? Like, you know, take away one hip check of Amari Stoudemire and, 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 and the, wait, was it Steve Nash got hip checked and then Amari Stoudemire got ejected. Came off the bench, boy. Right? Brutal. If you take that game away, maybe that changes everything. Who knows? Uh, but and then the same thing happened with the Warriors. You know, all season long, yeah, they look great. They have one of the best differentials of all time. But you can't win with that in the playoffs. So, and it's interesting that this year, like the Spurs and the Warriors are both doing it right, and they're both putting up historic differentials. And unfortunately, they can't both be in the finals. Ah, yeah. Well, they're um, playing their first game pretty soon here in the next couple of weeks so that'll be is that really the first time they're meeting they have not played yet no that's crazy so how are you how are you doing right now patrick anything more you want to say on show number 100 are you ready to get back to work uh, what are you thinking i think i'm ready to get back to work yeah and I, think I, I you know i don't want to say too much i want to let that interview kind of speak for itself there we go um and uh yeah so that was show number 100 people um you got any shout outs you want to do before we leave Brian? Um, ah, you know, I'll save my, okay, I'll do my shout outs real fast. I had some from a couple weeks ago. We got to get some, you know, Twitch TV nerd shout outs in. Oh, so, okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Some gaming stuff. So, yeah, so from, this is from last week, but um, Magic the Gathering, Grand Prix Oakland, Ben Rubin, the Hall of Famer, took second place and, uh, you know, he held the home turf down and, you know, he almost, he was one game away from winning. So that was really great. Good job, Ben. And the other, uh, you know, gaming shout out is to the speedrunning community, Games Done Quick. They raised over one point two million dollars to fight cancer doing their yeah. dreaming marathon a few weeks ago. So I saw that. That was amazing. Yeah, great job by them. And you know, of course, David Bowie and Lemmy, who just died from cancer in the last few weeks. Shout out to them as well. Great music careers. Man, cancer sucks. I hate to take it out that way. God, that's a terrible shout out, Patrick. Uh, yeah, that's, I'm not going to let you end on that. Um, you know, you mentioned those two. I'll, I'll give a good shout out to Alan Rickman, RIP Alan Rickman. Yeah. Um, way too soon. Um, totally one of my favorite actors. And in fact, like the, the Professor Snape role is probably pretty low on my list of like it, as far as the mm. roles he's played that I've loved. I mean, that's what he's probably going to be most known for in 20 years. But it feels like kind of the least of his accomplishments my favorite role was him as the sheriff in 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 robin hood oh um, yeah that was amazing yeah. um and then i i really loved him in um in in galaxy quest um and you know it just yeah all around great actor loved watching him work see those are the roles from our generation snape was kind of the next generation and then he had even more great roles before that yeah, you know, and that I can't remember oh, off the oh, top no. of my head. So my actually my absolute favorite role of him uh, that he did was as the colonel in um, Sense and Sensibility. Oh, there you really go. Really love that. I'm I'm sort of a little known fact maybe about me. I'm I'm a total Jane Austen fanboy. Like oh, wow. I love Jane. I love Jane Austen stuff. I've seen I've seen like every version you could possibly make of Pride and Prejudice, and I've seen a couple versions of Sense and Sensibility, and I think that version is like his his portrayal of the colonel there is is fantastic because. The reason it's so great is because he's totally casted against type because when you see him you think, oh, that's the guy who always plays the villains, right? He's casted against type but then he plays the role in such a way that by the end of the movie you've completely forgotten that that you know that he was sort of an ironic casting choice. You just believe that he's this like sort of misunderstood, quiet, down-to-earth um, guy. And just just like Snape. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> hmm. Snape, I would say, is definitely a role where he was not cast against type. That's fair. <laughs> Put it that way. And my other shout out, because we can't end on a cancer note. That's bullshit. Um, I'm going to shout out uh, Benjamin Morris with 538 for his article about how football coaches keep screwing up the math around going for the two-point show, uh, shot, two-point conversion, and we're not even talking about like complex. Um, you know, analytics. Do you remember like his that. headline? It was something like "Coaches Fail Middle School Math." No, no, coaches are waging a war against. Right? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. we got to talk about that article some more in the future. It was really good. I enjoyed it. It was a great article, and I particularly loved that because it's it's math and it's logic, right? 
Um, and it's interesting that he brought up the the Chiefs game, I think, because exactly the same thing happened in the um, in the in the in the Seahawks game. Mm. Not that it mattered, and for exactly the same reason, the Seahawks were down by fourteen. They needed to score, then they needed to do an onside kick, and then they needed to score again. And exactly, it's exactly the same situation. And everybody talks about, well, it's highly improbable you're going to get that onside kick, but the answer is, well, you don't care because if you don't make that, you're going to lose anyway. So, the you know, so what did they do? They scored and they they kicked a, an extra point, which means they still got to go for it just to get to overtime when they'll probably lose anyway. Um, just kind of um, exactly the same situation. And, and I remember at the time, I'm watching the Seahawks game. I'm railing against it. I'm like, you guys should be converting for two. Should be converting for two. In fact, I think I started arguing when they were down 31 to zero that they should essentially just be trying to convert for two on every time they score. Mm. Uh, and, and because I think, because if you do the math, if you do that four times, now you're within a field goal of tying instead of within. I mean, you uh, need running cards anyway, right? Basically, so you might as well just go for it. Well, no, what I, what I, so what I'm saying is they at the end they scored four touchdowns and they were down 31 24 right mm-hmm. well if they'd scored four touchdowns with four converted two pointers they'd be down 31 28 yeah which is a big difference and then and, and here's the thing if you miss one of those two point conversions you're down 31 30 26 or something and but it doesn't matter if you're down 31 24 or 31 26 right you're losing either way so you should just go for two point like Assume you're going to convert about half of your two-point conversions, then you're breaking even. And if you hit them all, then you're in a, a much better position, right? Um, yeah, well, you know, in Dre's I article... My, and my, and my, the people I was watching the game with are all looking at me like I was some dude from Mars. It's like, what are you talking about? That's, you don't you just kick the field, kick the PAT. <sighs> no, you're down 31-0. to zero. Start trying to catch up now. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's my shout-out. Benjamin Moore at 538. Um, with that, guys... And girls. Take us out. That was show number 100. Thank you for joining us. Um, check it out later on iTunes. You can find us at Twitch TV. You can find us on BoxCoreGeeks.com starting tomorrow. The next day, you'll see the transcript. Um, thank you for joining us, and have a great day.